to sacrifice Isaac. He never, uh, he did sacrifice him in his mind. He gave him up. He was willing to be without him for the rest of his life if that was God's will. And God gave him back to him. And so I want to pick up Genesis 22 in verse 15 and we'll read down through the end of the chapter and look at the aftermath, the blessings of God in his life after he was willing to do this. So Genesis 22 verse 15 says this, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. The first time is as he's got the knife in his hand about to slay his son. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven, saying, Do do thy son no harm. And so now he calls the second time uh, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, and Buz his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Kesed, and Hatso, and Pildad, Pildash, and Jidlath, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, whose name was Ruma, she also bare Teba and Gema and Thahash and Maaka. Let's pray together before we uh, jump in here. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the relevance of your word, that whatever we come to, we have some need in our lives that it can speak to, whether it's an immediate need or something that we'll have later. Maybe this morning you have us uh, to hear something that will build up our conscience so that we can give counsel to someone else at some point. We may have, we have no idea what may be in our future and help us to be attentive to your word and your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So this angel of the Lord that appears to Abraham is none other than Jesus himself. There are several times in the Bible that there are what we call theophanies or Christophanies. Uh, and a Christophany means it's an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before Uh, He was incarnated. Jesus did not become into being when he was born in a manger. Uh, He he, he not only pre-existed, there are some people who believe that he he was pre-existent before the manger, but they stopped there. Jesus not only existed before the manger, but he always existed before the manger. He was not created on the first day of creation. He was not um, the first, you know, there are some who, uh, for instance, the... Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that Jesus created everything else other than himself. But when the Bible says that Jesus created everything that's in heaven and on earth, uh, it means that uh, he, he, didn't, he was not a creature himself. He created everything. If Jesus was created, then you would say God the Father created Jesus, and then Jesus created everything else. But it says that Jesus created everything. So Jesus is not only pre-existent, which we see here, but he always was, the Bible says in the book of Micah, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Um, Jesus always has been. So that's who is appearing into Abraham. And he's often called the angel of the Lord. He is both, this is beyond our comprehension, Jesus is both the angel of the Lord and the Lord at the same time. He's his own angel. Uh, So we see that very quickly. Look at verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. He doesn't say, by myself have I sworn, saith the angel of the Lord. He is the angel of the Lord, and he says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. He is both the Lord and uh, the angel of the Lord. And the word Lord here, capital L, capital O-R-D, all caps, is Jehovah, who the Jews would agree is God the Father. So Jesus is both. He is all three. He is Uh, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah, and Jehovah, and Jesus. He's God the Father and the Son, but he's not God the Father in that he's separate, but he's equal with the Father. And what I just said is a mouthful that I don't even understand, but I believe it. 
because the Bible teaches that Jesus is both uh, the Father. He, um, Isaiah 9, 6, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Jesus is the Everlasting Father, and He's the Son, and He's the Angel of the Everlasting Father, or the Messenger of the Lord. Uh, all of this just speaks to His deity, the fact that He can do everything. He is everything. He's everywhere. Uh, so wonderful truth. And so Jesus says to Elijah, I'm sorry, he says to Abraham, and by the way, we mentioned this last week, uh, but remember that Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day in John 8. He rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. And this is one of the times we can say this, that, G that Abraham saw Jesus and he rejoiced. Boy, did he rejoice to see Jesus here because Jesus saves his son from having to die. And so because Abraham listened, verse 16, it says, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. He here reiterates the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant came in several waves. It came in Genesis 12. It came in Genesis 15. There was some in Genesis 17. Here in Genesis 22, he mentions no new thing, but he just... Uh, and by the way, he doesn't mention everything here. There's no mention here of the land, uh, but Abraham believes in the promise of the land. We'll see that even this morning. Uh, there's no mention of the, the promise of the land here, but he gives many of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. The interesting thing, the difference is that the first time around when God gave the, the uh, promises, he didn't attach it to any performance of Abraham. It was simply uh, Abraham believed God, and so God gave him promises, and Abraham just was there. God chose Abraham. When God uh, spoke to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees and said, I want you to leave your father's house, it's not because he was a wonderful, great man of God. For all we know, he didn't even know the Lord yet. He was, his family were uh, idol worshipers. His father was not a worshiper. They had idol worship trouble in their family later on. And so God just decided, I choose Abraham. And it was, had nothing to do. We saw at the time when one of the times God gave the Abraham covenant, when we see the actual covenant itself, that they took the, the uh, animals and they divided them in half. And Abraham was put to sleep and God walked through the midst of the pieces saying, the keeping of the Abraham covenant has nothing to do with Abraham or any of Abraham's descendants. It has everything to do with me. God said, I make this covenant just with myself. And so all the provisions of the Abrahamic covenant can never be done away because they're only based on God's faithfulness. But then the difference is that here God links these promises. He gives the promises again and he links them to Abraham's obedience. He says it twice. Uh, verse 16, because thou hast done this thing. And then the, the end of verse 22, uh, verse 18. The end of verse 18 says, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. And I have two thoughts we have this morning in our uh, sermon. One's from this chapter, one's from the next chapter. Number one is that Abraham's faith manifested in obedience. There are some times where it just says that Abraham believed God. He didn't necessarily do anything yet. But God gave Abraham a promise and he believed that promise and God counted to him for righteousness. Here, we see that Abraham's faith is manifested outwardly by works, by obedience. Abraham believed God and therefore he sacrificed his son or he was willing to sacrifice his son. And that obedience showed that he believed in the promises of God and remember we mentioned that last week in Hebrews 11, that he, he thought that God might raise him from the dead because he believed in the promises. I know for sure that Isaac is, can't die today because he's got to have children. He's got to have a seed. And so he believed in the promises of God and his faith manifested itself outwardly by obedience. Right now our children, um, three of our children are not here this morning, the youngest three, because they're struggling with hand, foot, and mouth disease. And what that is, is there's something in your body, and how do you know it's in there? It manifests itself on the outside, these red bumps that come up here and there. Uh, they come up on your, on your hands and your feet and on your mouth. I'm not sure why they call it hand, foot, and mouth disease. No, they come up all over your body. Elijah's got them everywhere. Uh, some visible, some not visible to you. 
Uh, and so, uh, but there's something in his body that, that works its way, and the way you know it's there is because it manifests itself on the outside. Would to God that all of us would manifest like hand, foot, and mouth disease. Hopefully that doesn't gross you out or turn you off to it, but hopefully the world would know that you believe in God because you have obedience manifesting itself on the outside, and it's all over your body. You're obeying God everywhere in your life. Uh, and so that's what Abraham does. There is a great link in the Bible. Um, turn to the book of James, James chapter 2. This passage causes some people to stumble. It doesn't need to. I'll real fast explain the difference. Uh, great men of God, by the way, have stumbled by the book of James, and particularly James 2, particularly this passage we're about to read. Among them was Martin Luther. He called the book of James an epistle of straw because he, it seemed in his mind to contradict the book of Romans and other places where it says that salvation uh, is only by faith. Uh, and that is true. This doesn't contradict that, but there's a different perspective in the book. of. And by the way, even Romans 4 and James 2 both mention Abraham and his justification. And Romans 4 says Abraham was justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And James 2 says Abraham was justified by his works. And so you have an obvious contradiction here, right? Uh, the, the difference is the perspective. In Romans 4, we're talking about God's perspective and actual salvation, that God doesn't look at our works at all. You're saved by faith, by believing. And Abraham was saved by believing. Abraham was saved before Genesis 22, by the way. Um, there are several times in the Bible that it says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed or accounted him for righteousness. And it applies that statement in different times of his life. But Abraham's salvation, I believe, came all the way back when he uh, met God in Ur of the Chaldees. He believed in God and then he left. Um, Abraham is in heaven today because of faith without works. But James 2, what we're about to read, talks about a different angle. It talks about our perspective. How do we know that Abraham was justified. If Abraham sat there and just believed and didn't do anything, God would know that he was saved, but we wouldn't know it. And the way that we know it and the way that the world can know that you are saved is by what comes out on the outside, by what manifests. Otherwise, the world would have no clue. So that's the perspective. So look at James 2, and let's start reading in verse 18. It says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? And so this is the story in Genesis 22 that it's referencing. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So you can see how if you've got the wrong perspective here, you can really struggle here and how Martin Luther struggled and says, hey, sounds like work salvation. The Bible never contradicts itself. The Bible never teaches work salvation. We have to know that or else we're in trouble or else we're going to have to go through the whole Bible. And here's what some do. They go through the Bible and they say that God's word is inspired in spots and I'm inspired to spot the spots, you know. I can tell what's God's word and what's man's word. And man, it would be so difficult to sort it out. We have to know that everything you have in your Bible is inspired. God said it and it's true and it never contradicts itself. That's got to be your starting point. So then we come to a place like this uh, where we struggle and we have to uh, pray and ask God to give us wisdom and, and they all reconcile. So that's, that's what um, my perspective on James 2 is, is that it's talking about an outward perspective to the world. We know that Abraham was justified or he was justified to the world or in the sight of the world because of his faith. Um, look at James, or Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians 5 and verse 6. I want to look at two other verses that talk about this great link between uh, biblical concepts. Galatians 5 and verse 6. 
This is another verse that says that faith works. If you have faith, it should, it will result in a certain way in works. So Galatians 5 verse 6 says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. How do you know when faith is working? There's love involved. Say it's interesting. You don't usually mix, blend faith and love together. It says if somebody has faith, they will work and it will come out and there will be love manifested on the outside. You know there's faith on the inside because you see love on the outside. Faith worketh by love. And then look at another verse, John 14, verse 15. John 14, 15. This is Jesus to his disciples, uh, the night of the Last Supper. We'll just look at this one verse. It says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. What's a simple word for that? It's obedience. If you love me, obey. So there is a link between faith and love. Faith worketh by love. There's a link between love and obedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. And there's a link between faith and and obedience, as we saw in James 2, uh, that faith without works is dead. We have to work to demonstrate that we have faith. There's this grand connection in the Christian life between believing in Jesus. By the way, going to heaven, believing in Jesus, that's it. But as Christians, there's, here's the difference. There's justification and then there's sanctification. Sanctification is that process whereby we grow and we demonstrate uh, that we believe in God and we love him. So there's a great connection between believing in Jesus and then loving him and then obeying him. By the way, don't, don't forget that, that link of love in the middle. That's a great motivator. You don't just, I believe and so I do things. Love for God is a tie that brings all that together. I believe that what God said is true and it makes me love him. And because I love him, I want to work. Are works necessary in the Christian life? And the answer to that is yes and no. They are not necessary to go to heaven, but that doesn't mean they're not necessary. As Christians, do we have to work for God? The answer is yes. If you love me, Keep my commandments. And all throughout the Bible, the Bible says that we were created, uh, God, we, God saved us and created us unto good works. God wants us to work. God never wants us to rest on our blessed assurance. You know, uh, I know I'm saved and that's good enough for me. We have to work for God because the world is looking. And if, if zero Christians ever work for God, that will drastically reduce the number of people that will believe. The Bible shows there's a great link between our testimony in the world. We shine our lights and they glorify our Father. How do they glorify our Father? By believing. The world is saved many times as a result. It is God's Word that saves, obviously. But what attracts them to God's Word, what allows them many times to open their hearts to hear it, is that they see the life of a believer. God changed me. God delivered me. God saved me. And they see that come out. And then they want it. There's a holy thirst for that. There's a holy discontent with their own lives. And they want to have what we have. We have to work. We cannot just sit around and do nothing. Will you make it to heaven if you do that? Yes, if you believe in Jesus. But there is so much more to eternal life than just your address, than just your mailing address for all eternity. So much more to eternal life than just that. It's not just a get out of hell free card. It's not just a get into heaven. It's not just a meal ticket. It is your life in the, in the phrase, by the way, there's a difference between eternal life and everlasting life. We often blend them and think that eternal is just this time word. Everlasting life has to do with uh, the time. It, in, it goes on forever. The word eternal life is the Greek word is ionios, and it literally could be translated the life of the ages. It has to do with the quality of life. It has to do with that God gives you an awesome life. Uh, Jesus said, I came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. It's not just existence for a period of time. It is an awesome abiding in God at every moment of your life. God, so you have eternal life, not just when you die and go to heaven. You have eternal life now. And it should be manifesting on the outside. I believe that God has saved me and I love him and I have eternal life. And I can't help but for the world to see it. Redeemed, 
how I love to proclaim it. I'm not just redeemed, but I love to tell and show other people. And so we have to work in our Christian lives. But don't look at it as a drudgery. Don't look at it like, oh, back to the grindstone. You know, I got to keep uh, punching this button every day and keep pounding on this rock. That's not the Christian life. It's I'm saved and I get to work for the King of Kings. I get to represent him to the world. And it's a great motivation to get up every day. I love God. I want to go work for God today. I want to go work in his field um, for the night is coming. So there's a great connection in the Christian life between believing in Jesus and loving him and obeying him. If you have a, a child and his parents leave the house and they give instructions, I want you to clean your room. We're going to be back at 3 o'clock p.m. When we get back, if that room is clean, we will take you to Disneyland tomorrow. Like, that's a good trade-off. All i got to do is clean my room, and it saves me, what does it cost to go to Disneyland? Like $4,000 for a day, right? Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's 5000 actually now. But what a great deal. How do you know if that child believes that if he cleans his room by 3 o'clock when his parents get home, he'll go to Disneyland tomorrow? How do you know that he really believes that? he would hopefully try to clean his room. But if it's 2.55, if it's 2.59, and he's done nothing to clean his room, you'd have to come to a couple of conclusions. One, he either doesn't believe his parents are coming home at three. He either thinks he has more time, or he doesn't believe his parents actually have the money to take him to Disneyland, or he's really not too thrilled about riding the teacups anyway because they make him dizzy. But there's some breakdown. If he doesn't do anything, you'd have to come to the conclusion that if it's something that he really loves, and if it's something that he believes his parents would give him, and they're going to be home at three, if he believes that, he's going to do something about it. And you'd have to come to the conclusion if he does nothing, he must not really believe that. That's what the world will think about us. And if, and if they don't think we believe it, they're not going to believe it. If people who go out and proclaim, you know, like Lot did to his sons-in-law, if we go out and proclaim, this is going to happen, but they see nothing come out of our lives, they'll come to the conclusion they don't really believe that. That if Jesus is going to, he will reward me for living a holy life, separated from the world. For all of eternity, I'll have eternal crowns. If they don't see me living a holy life, they must, they'll, they'll say he doesn't really believe he's going to get that reward. Or if he believed he was going to get that reward, he would surely do something about it. And if the world sees that we don't believe, they will not believe. We demonstrate faith by obedience. And I know that's a general statement because there's lots of commands in the Bible. But that means that there are lots of opportunities to show God that we believe in him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. In that link between obedience, without obeying God, it is impossible to please God. So don't look at, uh, you don't know the future, you don't know what's going to happen. Don't look at that as, a, oh, uh, I've, I've got to obey, I've got to do this. Look at, this is an opportunity for me to please God in my life. This is an opportunity for me to lay up treasures in heaven, uh, where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. So number one this morning, we see a great faith in Abraham that's manifested in obedience. We know that he believed God, and God actually says it himself. He says, now I know that thou fearest God because you haven't withheld your son, your only son. We need to learn that link and, and never go and obey God in your life out of drudgery because I've got to do it. Always allow the right motivation. I want to obey him because I love him because I believe his promises. He's given it. We'll talk more about his promises in just a little bit. But I believe those promises, and I love him for those promises, and so I want that to come out of my life. I want to show the world uh, that I believe. Um, so number one, Abraham's faith manifests in obedience. Number two, and by the way, let me just say uh, something very, we're going to get in chapter 23. The end of chapter 22, verses 20 through 24, it just shows a little bit of the genealogy of Abraham's brother Nahor. The reason it does this is because they come into the lineage later. Uh, you see Rebekah's name. Uh, in, so Abraham, uh, Milcah, and Nahor, they have children. The first two are Huz and Buzz. They must have been twins. Uh, and you name them Huz and Buzz like that. Um, one had a Huz cut and the other had a Buzz cut in their hairstyles anyway. Um, and so, and then they have eight children until there's Huz and Buzz and Kemuel and Kesed and Hatso and Pildash and Jidlaf and Bethuel. And then it says, and Bethuel begat Rebekah. Why does it mention that? Because later, Abraham's son Isaac goes and marries Rebekah. 
Uh, so a couple generations down on the other side. And so it shows that link. It wants to show um, the relationship to all these people. Uh, and so it bears out there a little bit of the, the uh, family tree uh, on the other side of Abraham's family. Uh, all right, let's go into chapter 23. And let's read verses 1 and 2. The, our second, um, we're now going to dwell on death a little bit. Chapter 23 is about the, the death of Sarah. And uh, so, number one, Abraham manifests faith uh, by obedience. Number two, we say Abraham's faith in the death or through the death of Sarah. So, Genesis 23, look at verse 1. It says, Sarah, and Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep. For her. So she's 127. How old is Abraham then? He's 137 at this point. Abraham lives to be 175. So Abraham's got 38 more years after Sarah dies. Usually it's the woman outliving the man. Here in this case, by the way, interesting uh, note of trivia, Sarah is the only woman in the whole Bible that we know how old she was when she died. That's uh, for some reason, God chose to record that. The only woman that we know how old she was when she died. So she's 127. And so uh, Isaac is 37. Isaac is, Isaac is uh, Abraham's. Isaac is zero years old when he's born, by the way. Um, Abraham's 100. So now Isaac is 37 when his mother dies and he's still single. And so if you uh, feel like you're getting up in years and you're still single, there's hope for you. Isaac was 37. Uh, others in the Bible were even older than that. Um, so he's 37 years old and Abraham's 137 and he, how old was Isaac when God told him to sacrifice Isaac? When God told Abraham to sacrifice, we don't know for sure. Maybe he was 20, maybe he was 25, maybe he was 30, maybe he was 35. Uh, he had to be, um, younger than 37, obviously, but we don't know how much time elapses here when Abraham has back to back one, he has uh, really back to back to back. Remember, he has sent away Ishmael. He's lost his son Ishmael. God told him to send him away. And then God tells him, I want you to um, sacrifice Isaac. And he almost loses Isaac, but then he doesn't. And then he does lose uh, Sarah. So we saw Abraham's faith in the potential losing of Isaac. And then we hear this morning, we see Abraham's faith in the actual losing of of Sarah, it says that he uh, he wept for her. He he came to he uh, in Hebron she died. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So he cried. He mourned over the loss of his his wife. But when the Bible says that people mourn over death, it says that we don't mourn as those who have no hope. It doesn't mean that we don't mourn. We obviously mourn. There is death. There's nothing wrong with shedding tears and crying. It's not, uh, you, uh, you need to be a man. And uh, if you break down, I saw a tear come out of the eye. You wimp, you sissy. No, that has nothing to, the greatest men in the Bible mourned over things. They were moved by things. You don't have to be embarrassed about crying. And you don't have to feel like you're a, a greater man if you hold back the tears. Um, there are some things that if you cry about, you're a sissy, but this is not one of them. And so Abraham mourns and he weeps over his wife. They have lived together for more than 100 years probably. We don't know how old they were when they got married, but if she were, if she were say, 20 and Abraham was 30 when they got married, then they've lived together for over 100 years of marriage. They've experienced life together. They've experienced a lot. They've experienced dearth of a family that you know they had a lot materially but they've experienced 70 years together of no children and being able to grow together through that they've seen uh, lapses in faith of each other they've seen triumphs they've learned from each other the bible actually holds up sarah as a model wife look at uh, the book of second peter in the new testament second peter chapter three the bible holds her up as an example to other women as a god as a godly wife and she obviously wasn't perfect. We saw times where she lapsed in faith. We saw times where she talked Abraham into sin. Uh, but God in the New Testament never says Sarah was a failure of a wife. Look what she led her husband into. God holds her up as an example of a great uh, wife. So look at 2 Peter 3 and verse 5. 
It's talking about here um, the role of a wife in marriage and uh, including submission and being godly on the inside. Uh, the Bible says that this is a great principle, not only for women, but for men. Don't spend too much attention on the outside that you neglect the inside. The inward person is much more valuable because the outward fades. The outward uh, decays eventually and then eventually you die. But the inward is real. And so Sarah was that. So look at verse 5, 2 Peter 3, 5. It says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. And so it mentions that Sarah was submissive to her husband. And this was difficult. What is, what's one of the things that the Bible says about Abraham? One of the things that God says about Abraham that would be difficult to be his wife in is that God said that Abraham was a sojourner. He never had a settled home. He was transient. That is difficult. You know, as guys, we can't really relate to this. We're fine with whatever. I can sleep on a couch. I can sleep, I can sleep on a rock. I can live with next to nothing. Um, this is not to say that men are better than women or, or men are, you know, can tough it out better. But just something that God has put in women, it's particularly when they get married, God's put in wives, is this desire to nest, this desire to, you know, have a home that they decorate. And there's a, a fair amount, this doesn't mean they don't have security in God, but there's a fair amount of stability and security in having a stable home. And God did not allow for Abraham and Sarah to have that. God told Abraham, I want you to leave and travel. In his whole life, he traveled, and Sarah submitted to that. She had a difficult life of not being able to put down roots, which is important for most humans, and particularly for women, particularly for wives. And, and Sarah didn't question. It, it puts in there, it, it you know, hints to us that she didn't live her life complaining about this. We never, how come we can't be like all the other families? Just live a normal life. How come they can't have a normal house with a normal this and a normal that? She submitted to God's will for her husband and God's will for their family. And God praises her for that. But that would have been a difficult, they lived for a hundred years together without having a settled home. She never knew if tomorrow we're packing up again and we're going to move again. And God has that will for many families and many, uh, and, and so it's difficult, but God will praise those women uh, and reward those women that submit to that and are willing for whatever God's will is in their lives. And so Sarah was a godly, she was a wonderful woman that Abraham had the privilege to live with for a hundred years, and now she's gone. And this was a great void in his life, and he wept and he mourned for her, he loved her. And the rest of this chapter, chapter 23, shows that he spends the time to go out and find a place that he can bury her, that he can give her an honor, that he can honor her with a, with a burial. And so let's read the chapter very quickly, and then we'll uh, make some remarks about it. Verse 3, Genesis 23, 3. And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. By the way, interesting that they recognize this about him. He doesn't own any property. He doesn't own any land. But he does have some means. He's got cattle and sheep and oxen and so forth. And he's got a lot of people in his house that live with him. He's got over 318 men that are soldiers. So he, he's, uh, he's got kind of a traveling empire. Maybe he, it's not a big empire, but um, he's, he's, he's recognized as a mighty prince. He is respected even though he doesn't have anything as far as property. So look at verse, um, verse 6 in the middle. Uh, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulcher, but that thou mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field. For as much money as it is worth, 
He shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephraim dwelt among the children of Heth. And Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein, I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. By the way, it mentions that twice, that he bows before the people of the land. To, he's just, this is courtesy, this is reverence. He, he is honoring those around him. It doesn't mean that he's necessarily subservient to them. And by the way, as Christians, God never says that we should go around careful that we don't accidentally show uh, a subservience to someone so that we... We uh, lift them up too high and they're above us. The Bible says that we should be willing to do this to anyone, by the way, even our enemies, that we should be willing to serve. We should be willing to be thought little of. And so this is not a humiliation. Oh, no. He bowed down to them. What are we going to do now? Everything's ruined. His respect is gone. He shows them respect and there's a mutual respect going back and forth. And uh, if we struggle with this, we just have too much. We're too big for our britches sometimes. We have too much ego. Uh, We should... It doesn't, Jesus came down and he humbled himself. He made himself of zero. He made, made himself of no reputation. We need to be willing to do that in our lives. So Abraham bows down, mentions it twice. Look at verse 13. And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me and I will bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. So it's, um, people, I've heard people, you know, reading commentaries, uh, say this is how much this is worth in modern. Uh, we have no idea how much this was worth. Was 400, I, I heard someone say that 400 shekels of silver is way overkill for this land, that he's, overvaluing by a lot and he's insulting him by charging him this much. He's trying to take advantage of him. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, everyone knows, and by the way, how much, how much is a dollar worth? Well, it depends on if you're asking in 2018 or 2000 or 1900 or 1800. How much is a dollar worth? Uh, it all depends. I have no idea what inflation, this is thousands of years ago. So to say that uh, so much silver is worth so much land, I have no idea. Uh, but it, the way he talks about it, it sounds like this. Abraham, you're rich, I'm rich, this is worth 400 shekels of silver, what's that? That's pennies between us. Uh, It doesn't really matter what the price was, uh, but there was a price assigned to it. They both agreed that this is what it is worth. Abraham doesn't say anything like, what do you mean it's worth, who says it's worth that, it's not worth near that much, there's nothing like that going on. Uh, He said, they both agree, this is what it's worth, you pay me that, it's nothing between us, Uh, let's just, um, what he's not saying is, uh, he's not trying to talk him out of paying and saying, what is that betwixt us? You know, just forget about that. I'll just give it to you for free. When, when he says, I'll give it for free, and Abraham says, no, I want to pay for it. He says, okay, go ahead and pay for it. It's not much money. They do the transaction. Why does Abraham want to pay for it instead of accepting the free gift? Some could say, oh, he's insulting him. Um, when he offers a gift and now you want to pay for it, he's insulting that. I think one of the things Abraham is doing is this. We're on the same page right now. I respect you, you respect me. But what happens in the future with your children and my children? Because this happens. Uh, There arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And now the children of Israel are enslaved where they were honored before. And I think one thing Abraham is doing is saying, just so we can nail this down for the future. So nobody comes around and says, hey, you never paid anything for this anyway. We're taking this back. He, he, He just wants a little piece of land that he pays for that there's a title deed that you can go to later and say, this belongs to Abraham. He just wants some security there. And so he says, I'd rather pay for it than offer the free gift. Uh, And then that's accepted. And then look at verse 16. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim, and Abraham weighed to Ephraim the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. And the field of Ephraim, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave which was therein and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. And after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron 
in the land of Canaan. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a burying place by the sons of Heth. So the reason, by the way, have you ever wondered about the debate between burial and cremation? And uh, you wondered if someone's going one way as opposed to another, that, that one way is a Christian way to act and one way is a pagan way to act. Uh, and the Bible does seem to give a lot of weight to burying. Um, in fact, I want to look at let's let's look at these some of these passage some of these passages first, and then um, we'll mention and we'll talk a little bit about the debate between burial and cremation. Um, so that anyway, I was going to say something, but I won't say it. Um, look at Genesis chapter forty nine and verse twenty nine. It became important to all of the patriarchs: Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. It became important to all of them to bury at this location, to bury in the land of Canaan as opposed to somewhere outside of the land of Canaan. And why is that? Why was it so important to them? We'll get to that in just a minute. But look at Genesis 49 and verse 29. This is at the end of Jacob's life. He mentions this. It says, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. And when he says my fathers, he means Abraham and Isaac. They're both there already. In the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephraim the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. So Jacob makes sure that he is buried there. And then also Joseph. Look at Genesis 50 verse 25. Genesis 50. It says, And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. By the way, I've never, I briefly looked, I didn't find anything about this. But several years ago I heard a pastor say something that was intriguing to me and it should never be surprising when archaeology validates the Bible because we know everything in the Bible is true. It's history. It's not a history book. But whenever it speaks to something historical, you can bank on it. It's true. And so an there was an archaeological discovery in Egypt fairly recently. Again, I heard a pastor say this. Um, I won't tell you his name. He's a good pastor, but I won't tell you his name just so in case you go and research it and find the difference and say, he was wrong and I'm going to discredit this guy. Anyway, uh, that's not the point. But uh, he said that he had just read of an archaeological finding that in Egypt they had unearthed the coffin and in this burial place written on the, I don't know if it was on the coffin itself or on the doorway on the, uh, the building, was written Zaphnath Paaneah, which is the name of, that Joseph was given in Egypt, that they found his coffin or his burial place in Egypt. But he wasn't there, by the way. He was gone. So it says that he was embalmed, just like all the pharaohs were. Joseph was embalmed and put in a coffin in Egypt. And then look at Exodus 13 and verse 19. He was buried in Egypt, but he swore, he made the children of Israel swear that when God delivered them, God will visit you. In the Exodus, he says, you take me with you. I'm already going to be dead. My soul's not going to be there. But you take my bones and take them out of Egypt and bury them in the promised land. Look at verse uh, 19, Exodus 13, verse 19. It says, And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. This, by the way, is more than 400 years after Joseph makes him promise. So it's like in the year 1600, somebody says, uh, You're going to bury me, but when you, when you leave, you take me with you. And from 1600 till today, 400 years later, they dig him up and they take him with them. So this is a long promise that uh, is being fulfilled here. Look at um, uh, Joshua 24 and verse 32. 
So they take Joseph's bones with them when they leave Egypt. And then what happens? They thought they were going straight there, be there in the first year. They end up wandering for 40 years in the wilderness and somebody is in charge of Joseph's bones for 40 years. What's your job? I set up the tabernacle. What's your job? I, I go and dig wells and find the water. What's your job? I carry Joseph's bones. <laughs> I make sure nothing happens to them because they got to make it to the promised land. We promise. He made us promise. Um, look at Joshua 24, 32. It says, In the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for an hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So notice, so notice, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are built in the field of Machpelah. Joseph is not there, but he's somewhere else. Uh, Abraham bought the field of Machpelah. Jacob, his grandson, buys another place. And Joseph is buried in this place where Jacob bought uh, a different place, but it's in the promised land. I don't think it mattered as much to, I, to jo Joseph. didn't matter as much to Joseph that he was buried in, the same location where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, but it mattered to him that he's buried in the promised land. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then look at Hebrews 11, verse 22, the last verse about this, about the bones. Hebrews 11, 22, it says, by faith. And so we're going to, there's a link here in the faith that Abraham, I, Abraham has with Sarah and the faith that Joseph has. It says, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. The reason that Joseph wanted to be, born, wanted to be buried in the promised land was because he believed in the promise. And by the way, when Abraham is burying Sarah, he's been given two promises. One promise is, one day you're going to possess all of this land. And... Um, Let's look at that promise real fast. Look at Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14. We've looked at this in the past in Genesis, but I'll look at it real fast. This is the promise that God gave Abraham that he believed that shaped his desire to bury Sarah here. Genesis 13 verse 14. It says, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And this didn't happen in his lifetime, by the way. It happened after he died. But he believed that it was going to happen after he died. God gave him that promise, and another promise that God gave him was, your seed is going to leave this land and be a stranger in another land for 400 years. But after that, they'll come back. And so Abraham says, I believe and by the way, they never possessed the land before they left for 400 years. But he says, I believe that all this is going to happen. We're going to leave, and I believe we're going to come back, and this is our promised land, so I'm going to bury Sarah here as proof that I believe this is our land. And all he had at this moment was a little field and a little dinky cave inside this field. But he says, I believe in the promises of God. And it was important to Israel to be buried there so that they could show they believe in the promise of God. What do we think about Christian burial today? Do we have a place that you can be buried that's the promised land right now? Can you go, can you go buy a plot of land somewhere and say, this is, I claim this land for all of eternity. So I'm going to buy this, I'm going to bury it, and by bur being buried here, I claim this for all of eternity. There's no place like that, right? God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the way, there were eternal promises. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So salvation's coming. But God also gave them these temporal promises. He says, you're going to have this land. One day this land is going to be destroyed. It's going to be burned up with the earth. But for a time, you're going to have this land. And they claimed that promise, and, Christ, and their burial was to show that they believed in that promise. What has God given us for promises? He hasn't, given, he, he hasn't told us we're going to inherit uh, things here forever. He's told us we have something greater. We have a heavenly city. So for a Christian to be buried somewhere, uh, I don't think necessarily demonstrates faith. You, you can demonstrate faith that God's going to come and raise your body up and you'll be in heaven forever. You can believe in the resurrection. But what happens, by the way, if you're, um, if you're an amputee? Well, 
that's it. You know, what does God do for that? If you, if you, if you lose your, what if you're born with no arms and legs? Are you going to have no arms and legs in heaven? You're going to be like in heaven, like veggie tails, you know, just kind of hopping around like this. No, that's silly, obviously. And if somebody is cremated, I'd say this to, uh, I, I know some people that were like this their whole lives. It's, the Bible talks about burial. It's burial, burial, burial. When I die, bury me. Do not cremate me. When I die, bury me. Do not cremate me. And then right before they die, they're like, okay, you can cremate me. <laughs> and it, did, it became less of a, you know, they just came around or whatever. They, they made it less of a deal. There's nothing in the Bible that says if you're not buried, but if you're cremated, that anything problematic happens. Uh, sometimes people can be cremated because they can believe that when you die, you're just gone, you're, you are annihilated, there's nothing there, so just cremate me to show that. That's possible. But you know, what happens for the great martyrs of the faith who were burned at the stake, who never got a burial? Is that a problem for God? Oh, no. God's in heaven saying, oh, they didn't get a burial. This is problematic. When, when God... Uh, raises our body someday. I don't know how it's all, always going to look. Uh, remember it says about um, David Livingston that his body is buried in England, uh, but his heart is buried. They took, they took his heart out when he was buried and he wanted his heart to be buried in Africa. Uh, so what's going to happen? Is it going to be like when, when Jesus comes back, there's going to be, shh, you know, across the seas and they're going to come together and uh, if somebody was an amputee that his arm and his foot comes together or oh, I cut off my finger in shop class and that's all going to be reunited. Uh, God, can, God doesn't have to struggle with any of that. And our glorified bodies aren't going to be like our bodies today anyway. So you don't have to worry. Uh, cremation doesn't disqualify anything. Now, if somebody wants to try to say something Christian in their burial and, and not, you know, if, if they personally believe that that cremation is a pagan thing in their minds, then uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But there's nothing in the Bible that's problematic about cremation. I, my personal thought is, do whatever is, is the cheapest. You know, if you're going to be buried, be buried in the cheapest pine box if your family will let you. Sometimes your, the family members are like, no, he was more important to me than that. I want to give him an expensive burial. But my thought is, do whatever is the cheapest so that you can provide for your family and you don't uh, cause them to struggle after your death. You know, my will is, I have to be buried in a $50,000 casket. And uh, so when I die, you're going to have to mortgage the house so that I can be buried properly. You know, don't be a burden on your family. Uh, anyway, there's nothing else in the Bible that really speaks to that. But you don't have to feel guilty about doing something that's cheap. Write, here's, here's what I say. Write your own will and force your family to sign that they're going to spend as little money as possible on you so they can use the rest for the glory of God and the kingdom of God and their, and their provision and so forth. Anyway, uh, that's not in the Bible what I just said. I just made it up. But uh, hopefully it's a, you can be a blessing to your family in your death. You don't want your family to have to... Uh, one thing, you don't want to be worth more to your family dead than alive because they might make some decisions. But two, you don't want to... You don't want to have them dread you dying because, oh, it's going to be so expensive. Uh, God takes us when we go, and um, they ought to be able to celebrate your life. Okay, um, said all that to say this. What has God given us promises for? God has not given us promises for this earth. God has given us promises that relate to heaven. And do you and I order our lives around the promises of God. Abraham was given a promise by God and he ordered his decisions around that. I believe that we're coming back to this promised land, so I'm going to go buy a cave. I'm going to bury my wife to show that I believe that we're coming back here. And God has given us many promises. Do you and I change our thinking? Do we order our steps based on the promises of God? And there's a lot. Let me just read a couple real fast. Proverbs 13:20 says this, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That's kind of like a promise. That's a true statement. That's a promise from God. If you hang around wise people, you will be wise. If you, are, if you hang around foolish people, you will be destroyed. What does a verse like that do to us? Do we order our lives? Okay, that person's a fool. Okay, I need to separate from that person. What happens if your spouse is a fool? Okay, that's a different ball of wax. Uh, but, you know, pray for them. But we need to surround ourselves. God, bring me to people that are wise. Help me to be wise so I can be like that to someone else. Order your life around the promises of God. Here's another one. Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
What does that promise do to us? We should come away from that and say, I am going to wait on the Lord. I'm going to order my life around waiting on God in my life. I'm not going to rush ahead. I'm not going to do whatever I want. I'm going to, I'm going to see what God will do. And he will sometimes uh, in anxiety or the opposite of this, it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Sometimes people's strength is waning. Their strength is failing. And they think, I've waited on God long enough and it's not working. I just got to do something else. It says, if you keep waiting, he will renew your strength. He'll give you all that you need. And there are obviously, there are a myriad of promises in the Bible. But do you order your lives? Do, do I order my life around the promises of God? That's how we can show that we really believe them. Um, Colossians 3 verse 1 says that we should seek those things which are above. We have promises that heaven's waiting for us. Uh, by the way, let's turn there. I like that passage. Colossians 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 4. Colossians 3 verse 1, and then we'll turn to a passage in Hebrews 13. Colossians 3 verse 1 says this, if ye then be risen with Christ, and by the way, the Greek construction there could be translated since. Since you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him, in glory. We have heaven waiting for us. That's our destination. That's going to be our eternal zip code. That's where we're going to live. So it says, seek those things now. We don't have anything here on earth. There's nothing here for us long term. And so many in the world, the Bible says they call their lands after their own names. They build monuments to themselves. They want a legacy. There's nothing for us here. You can leave some things behind for your children that will help them through this life a little bit, but there is nothing lasting. Everything that you leave to them is, that, is except for your, your testimony, except for godliness, except that spiritual legacy. But everything physical, it might help them day to day, but it is vanity. And if they trust in, that, in what you've left behind for them, they will fall. We have to teach our children to trust in what's eternal. Don't put your eggs into this basket of what's on earth because we have nothing for us here. Uh, look what Hebrews 13 says says. This is a great example that gives us about Jesus. And we'll read verses 13 through 15. Hebrews 13. And then if you want to go ahead and turn there, the last passage we'll look at this morning is 2 Corinthians 6. So Hebrews 13, verse 13 says this. This is just a, it's a mindset that we should live the Christian life with, and we actually can put it into action as well. It says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him. Who's him? Jesus. Go Unto Jesus, bearing, uh, go without the camp, bearing his reproach. What's the camp? The camp is society. It's the group of people. It's the associations. It's all of that. And the Bible says, sometimes you can be accepted. Sometimes there, there are times when you can do right and people respect you for that. There's nothing wrong with that. But most of life is you do right and you are rejected for it. And Jesus was rejected for it. And they took him outside of the city of Jerusalem to crucify him. They, didn't, they, they wanted him to be an outcast. This was where uh, you would take trash outside of the city. You would take things out. When you would kill someone, you'd take them outside of the city. You'd just get rid of them. Get them out of here. And Jesus was willing to do that. And it says, as Christians, we should identify with Jesus. We should say, I would rather be outside the city with Jesus and be reproached than to be accepted, than to be in, and to displease Jesus. I would rather choose, to choose reproach. And it says, let us go outside the city, bearing his reproach. For here, we have no continuing city. There's nothing for us here. But we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I like those three verses back to back to back. Uh, the middle verse is the one that we're kind of talking about this morning. We don't have anything here on earth. What we have waiting for us is in heaven. So it said there, there's kind of a progression of thought. It says, uh, for we, we, here we have no continuing city. 
verse 13 leads into verse 14, and verse 14 leads into verse 15. So it says that we should embrace obscurity, we should embrace rejection from this world, because we don't have anything here. We have something much better. So that should cause us to be willing to be rejected, because heaven's got everything for us. We have crowns in heaven. We have a home in heaven. God is in heaven. So we should be willing to separate from this world and be rejected because we have something in heaven. And then knowing what we have in heaven should cause us to go to the next verse. By him, therefore, because we have something waiting for us in heaven, therefore our lives should be about praising God and thanking God. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Our lives should look like this. I spend all my time praising God and thanking God and living for him because I have heaven waiting for me and I don't care what the world thinks about me. That's easier said than done because we live in a world where things are glitzy, and things are glamorous and there's nothing wrong with having money so I want it, you know. And then the love of money becomes the root of all evil. And we, want, we, don't, we don't want to be rejected and spat on and walked on. We want to be accepted, but the Bible says if you can see the difference, if you, can see, if you can separate the here and now from the eternal, know that the eternal is much better and we should praise and thank God for what we have in heaven and it doesn't matter what people think about us. That's the way that Abraham lived his life. He didn't care that he didn't, he lived his whole life and he owned nothing, but he knew that there was something to come. And that's our lives. We need to know that there is something waiting for us that's better than what we have now. If you have a billion dollars in the bank, anyone? Um, I hope you tithe. No. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a billion dollars in the bank, you have something waiting for you that's better than anything here. If you have all the money in the whole world and you're a Christian, you have something better waiting for you. So if you have no money, it doesn't matter. Because you have something better waiting for you that's better than all the money in the whole world. Don't live your life for the here and now. Set your affection on things above. I want to finish with 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Paul had this attitude as an apostle and as a Christian. That's a great example to us. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're laying up treasure on earth, then your heart's going to be with the things of earth. So how do you, how do you get your heart to heaven? We lay up our treasures in heaven. We live for God. We live for heaven. And he will reward us. He'll put treasures there. And then we can't wait to get there. I want to see what's waiting for me. And then our heart is there. So Paul's heart was in heaven. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. It says, as unknown and yet well known. This passage is, is really beautiful with all the paradoxes. Uh, Paul was unknown on earth. And he says, it's fine. I'm unknown and I don't care because in heaven I'm well known. By the way, here's a quick question. Are you well known in heaven? Does heaven know about your works? Does heaven know that you're living for God? Uh, or when you get up there, you're like, you are in here. I had no idea you were going to make it here. Does heaven know your name? Uh, anyway, Paul was well known in heaven. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. I love that phrase. You can be poor but make people rich spiritually. That is life. Who cares what you have? You are giving away eternal life from God. You're, you're passing on eternal life as poor yet making many rich. And I love this last phrase, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Isn't that beautiful? You can go through life and have nothing and yet everything. It doesn't say as having nothing and yet you will possess all things. It says having nothing and yet possessing right now. We already possess all things. We are already joint heirs with Christ. That what God will hand down to Jesus, we're already in the family. And it doesn't matter if we have nothing because we possess all things. And, you know, when people, uh, you ever seen these commercials where they're naming the stars and they're selling? You can, you can name your own star for $25. What? You're like calling in. You don't have the right to sell that star. I already own that star. I possess all. I don't think they'd listen to that. And it wouldn't stand up in court for sure. 
But it doesn't matter if we have nothing. Abraham, as far as property, had nothing in the promised land. But he was going to have it, and he believed in that, and so he ordered his life around that. And we in this life might have nothing, but we are going to have everything, so we should order our lives around those promises. I don't have to be discouraged. That's why he says that we can be sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. We can always be rejoicing no matter what's going on because we have everything. We have the God of the whole universe on our side, inside of us, guiding us, giving us promises. Abraham lived his life with joy even though he didn't own anything in the promised land. And he buried his wife to show that he believed in the promises. What are you and I doing right now to show the world that we believe the promises of the Bible? Do they look at us and there's no difference between us and an unbeliever? You believe in God? I never would have guessed that. What are we doing to show the world that we believe in the promises? Because we might believe, we might make it to heaven, but the world will never know it until it manifests on the outside. What are we doing to show the world that we really believe? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this passage, for the example that Abraham gives us, that he believed and so he obeyed. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. And because of that, you poured out blessings on him. We know that there is great blessing and obedience. We know the, the only way to grow in our Christian life, the only way to live the Christian life is by works, by obedience. Whatever you tell us in the Bible, we believe it and we go out and do it because we love you. And then, Lord, I pray that we'd come to all the promises in the Bible and that we have so many that are directly for us. And we would not only believe them, but we would tar start taking steps now, today. We would begin ordering our lives so that we can experience a greater fullness in this life, so we can show the world that this is what it's all about. It's not about the money. It's not about the fame because the money's going to burn up someday. And the fame, we're, we are so worried about people that reject you, what they think about us, but one day they're going to perish Help us to care what you think. This morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe God has spoken to your heart this morning about the things of this life. We don't want to be a sojourner. We want to have security. But is our security in the things of this life or is our security in God? We want to have money. We want to have fame. We want to have, uh, maybe not necessarily fame, but you want to have some level of respect. Maybe you want to have a career that advances, that you go somewhere so that the world will call you successful. Um, but the things that are um, highly esteemed in the eyes of men are abomination in the eyes of the Lord. We need to learn how to separate that. Maybe God has spoken to your heart about that. Maybe God's spoken to your heart about obedience in your life. Maybe you say, I believe, but have been lacking obedience. Maybe there's been a specific command or maybe just general commands. Maybe there's something in your heart God has spoken to you. I have not been obeying in this. Maybe it's something you should be doing. Maybe it's something that you should not be doing, that you have been doing. Whatever it is in your heart, maybe God has spoken to you and wants you to lift your level of obedience and your level of love for him and your level of faith. The way we demonstrate that we believe is by our obedience. Let's all stand together this morning as music softly plays. If God has spoken to your heart about something, maybe you'd like to come and kneel at an altar and say, God, I give you all over again, maybe for the first time, I give you my life. I believe in you and I want to obey you. Maybe you've been holding on to things of this life. Maybe God's spoken to you to say, God, I let go. I want to lay up treasure in heaven. I want to show the world that I believe in his promises. And then we'll close together.
pray that we would just really be thrilled about what is waiting for us in heaven, that we can't wait to get there. We haste and yearn for your soon coming so that you can take us out of this world and help us to live for eternity now. Help us to think about it. Help us to love it. Help us to set our affection on things that are above, not on things on the earth. We know that we have to, to stay on the field, so to speak. We know we have to, to live here and occupy until you come. But help us not to chase it. Help us not to rely on it, but to rely on you for all of our security. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.